The Thrill of the Chase has been a memoir full of anecdotes. The last one in the book is on page 119. The memoir changes when we get to Flywater. This chapter was originally published in 2008 and appears in the book with some light editing. However, Forrest tacked on two introductory paragraphs on page 121 to smooth the transition. The last sentence in Father on the Banco mentions his parents, and the first sentence here is about them as well. These paragraphs are a bridge between 120 pages of memoir and the 20 or so pages of material that center around the launch of the treasure hunt in the wake of a cancer diagnosis. This page has just a touch of the self-conscious voice from the preface. In fact, the I think that's funny comment harkens back to page 6. It's a safe bet that the preface and this two-paragraph introduction were written at roughly the same time, likely in the spring of 2010. The memoir also lets photographs do some of the heavy lifting as far as storytelling, and the anachronistic double-spread scrapbook here is no exception. Suddenly, we're back in Yellowstone, even though we left that section 60 pages ago. This chapter is one of the main reasons people think the treasure chest is hidden in the Yellowstone area. Despite all his many adventures, Forrest says his summers there were the best times of his life. And in this chapter, he wants to describe what it's like to love something dearly and leave it behind. The second drop cap marks the real start of the chapter. Even if we didn't have the newspaper article, you can sense the change in tone. It's notable for its rich, lyrical language. Like a painter who can practice in different styles, Forrest can write in different vernaculars. Flywater is about as close to poetry as prose can be. There are examples of tautology here, unusual word order, and archaic poetic expressions. Forrest said his church is in the mountains and along the river bottoms, and this surely is one of his church's sacred texts. But apart from the lofty language, it's very straightforward and simple in its layout. The chapter has a chiastic structure. There are links between the first two paragraphs and the last, where he explicitly references death. The specific references to the book Flywater occur in paragraphs 3 and 8, where he moves the book from one place on the shelf to another, a simple but elegant metaphor of transference. This puts the emphasis on the central component, paragraph 5, where the author comes to accept that others must take his place. He ties it to the changing of the seasons, but not literal seasons. It's rather mystical. Seasons change, leaves die and fall, but they're reborn. Those who love and revere this place, they have their turn, and then there's generational transference as others come along. He even recognizes that there was a generation before him. You see progress here. His acceptance of what must happen is complete. Lest you think this is all about fishing, Forrest corrects you. It's about three vital spiritual connections one can have. An inner connection, friendship, and a connection to nature. Humankind's domination of nature is acknowledged in the past time, but then he rightly chooses an animal that neither hunts us nor is hunted. There's generational transference here as well, as a moose accompanies her calf to the water's edge. On a metaphorical level, Yellowstone is life itself, and his departure, death. Others will come in his place, not knowing the spaces he occupied and the memories he made, but he comes to accept this. The last paragraph borrows from Alan Seeger's I Have a Rendezvous with Death, written during the First World War, and in a somewhat abrupt and deeply personal turn, Forrest clarifies the referent of the second-person pronoun from the original version, adding Peggy's name. Golden Moor opens with a detailed description of a boy's blossoming habit of collecting, starting with bottle caps and moving on to string. And it's not clear at first what any of this has to do with a treasure chest filled with gold. The word fun is important here, 
It'll come up again in a key passage. What ruined the fun of his first foray into collecting? The fact that he obtained an enormous collection? No, the fact that his father did all the obtaining. What ruined the fun of the string collection? The collection itself was stolen. Once again, he obtained a huge collection, so big it couldn't fit through his bedroom door, but he got to acquire it all. Forrest is giving us a window into what makes him tick as a collector. Then the terrible five words, like a lightning bolt, and then I got cancer. Let's take a moment and go back to 1988, an important and pivotal year for Forrest. In 1987, Forrest and Peggy were anticipating a new chapter in life. They were gearing up to sell their business, which would necessitate a move to a new home since the Fens lived in the second story of the gallery. He also acquired San Lazaro in 1987, launching an avocation that would thrill him and consume his time, his own Pueblo to excavate. At some point in 87, Forrest felt some pain when he would lie down. He had lost his father very recently, but he doesn't act right away. He does what many people in this situation do. Nothing. The following year, he was at a party and talked casually to a doctor. The doctor said he should get it looked at. He had a PET scan or some similar procedure, and the nurse administering it called another nurse over. Hey, get a look at this. It was renal necrosis, a dead kidney. Dr. Taylor Floyd said he wouldn't normally remove a kidney simply because it wasn't working, but because of the pain he advised it. Forrest asked, what are the chances of it being cancer? And the doctor dismissed it. Five percent. Surgery was scheduled. Dr. Floyd thought the procedure would be routine, one hour tops. But when he got inside, everything changed. He discovered a large tumor at the vena cava, the largest vein in the body. At this point, the doctor would have called for a biopsy, knowing, however, that it was likely cancerous, which is deadly serious. But the procedure itself now became vastly more complicated. The nurse monitoring Forrest's heart, the anesthesiologist, Dr. Floyd and his team, the nurses on hand, everyone canceled everything for the rest of the day. They undoubtedly needed more personnel. They needed to talk to Peggy. They might have needed another surgeon, possibly two. It took five hours, working delicately around the vena cava and the heart. Forrest later awakened the bad news. They did what they could, but they said he had a 20% chance of living three more years. He started chemotherapy and radiation treatments. He was bedridden for many weeks. He was depressed, discouraged. He thought he was going to die. He was 58, and chances were he'd be dead at the end of his 60th year. Later in the memoir, he refers to this as the Black Abyss. For the next few months, he says his life was put on hold. He couldn't get out and excavate at San Lazaro like he'd planned, couldn't move around like he wanted. He probably had to make decisions with his contractor for the new house from his bed rather than going out to the site and seeing things for himself. They sold the gallery but their house was still being built. Forrest and the new owner came up with an agreement that stipulated the Fens could stay in their second-story home until their new house on the Santa Fe Trail was completed, while Forrest served as an unpaid consultant to the new owners. Years passed, and Forrest was eventually declared cancer-free. But his doctors had one final statistic for him that hung over his head. 80% chance the cancer would return and kill him. Our narrative fast forwards to 1996. He doesn't tell the Ralph Lauren story here, but it was Forrest's conversation with him that got him thinking about the old saying, you can't take it with you. The it had always been so important to Forrest, precious relics that tell stories and hold secrets. He had filled his new home with artifacts he loved, and he would eventually start up a website named after his new location, apparently to stay connected to the world of Native and Southwestern art. You can't take it with you, bothered Forrest. He was unearthing artifacts every day at San Lazaro. The thought of relinquishing it all troubled him deeply. His relationship with his own mortality was different now. 
He'd been given a reprieve, but how long could that last? How many people go two rounds with cancer, winning the first, but not the second? The idea was conceived during this time, when he was living under the cloud of a statistic, but far enough removed from pathology results and pain to think he might have the strength and the years to pull off one last feat of imagination and daring. If you've ever told anyone about the chase, about Forrest hiding a valuable treasure in the mountains, undoubtedly they asked why. Here's the answer. It had been so much fun building my collection over the decades. Why not let others come searching for some of it while I'm still here, and maybe continue looking for it after I'm gone? Flywater described Forrest transferring emotional ownership of his secret places in the mountains. Here he's turning over treasure and the thrill of searching for it. It's all for fun, just like with his first collections as a boy. And he had the main ingredients from the start, a treasure chest filled with gold and jewels that he hides and leaves clues for. Treasure chest immediately conjures an image, a meme. Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island single-handedly shaped our understanding of buried gold and treasure maps. Treasure Island gave birth to every pirate story from Captain Hook to Pirates of the Caribbean. And then there are the stories from the Old West, hidden loot and outlaw treasure. I invite you to watch my separate video in which I investigate what exactly is inside the chest, but for our purposes here, we want to see this enterprise in the context of the memoir's story, in the context of Forrest's life. It's astonishing. The memoirist isn't merely issuing a vague challenge to live life to the fullest, grab the bull by the horn, something like that. No, the chest is tangible. The treasure hunt is real. This paragraph contains the idea of transference, so prominent in Flywater, like handing off a baton. Forrest says he derived so much pleasure from searching and wanting and finding that he wants to share it. But it's more than that. This treasure hunt is personal, not just in passing along a passion. He's tethered this treasure hunt to his life story. He's put cherished personal belongings inside the chest. And he only hints at it here, but Forrest plans to participate in our chase. He's inviting participation in his story. We are helping to write this final chapter in Forrest's life in our small ways, and potentially in a big way if we find the treasure chest. No wonder Michael Houle has referred to the treasure hunt as performance art, finding the chest like entering a theater where a play is in progress, frozen, where the play has been constructed for an audience of one person. Right now, books being studied, maps perused, searchers enthusiastically sharing their ideas, planning their trips, and of course people out in the mountains breathing the fresh air. All of this is becoming part of his story. It's also personal because he's appealing to people whose sense of adventure has already been awakened, like his. Indiana Jones types, he calls them. By the way, you'll notice that the unemployed redneck with too many kids is not here. That repeated expression wouldn't appear for two more years. He says indecision is the key to flexibility, and I think this alludes to the fact that Forrest was experimenting with many different scenarios for 13 or 14 years. At first he wanted someone else to write his story. Then he began writing his own stories. He was going to die with the treasure chest, but the cancer never came back. He left many stories out of the memoir, so we can say there were, at least theoretically, different versions of the memoir. We know for a fact there were different versions of the poem. As far as which came first, we may have a chicken and egg problem. Once he began filling the treasure chest, he tried several versions of that, and of course there was the question of when. On and on it went, until something finally pushed him. Some have wondered if Salinger's death prodded him to act, finally. I think it's more likely that his 80th birthday, mentioned here, looming on the horizon, put a fire under him. This paragraph also gets to the where question. He says, I knew exactly where to hide the chest, so it would be difficult to find but not impossible. It's in the mountains somewhere north of Santa Fe. 
Later in interviews, Forrest will unpack this a little bit more, revealing that the hiding place was special to him. Again, a personal connection. So I wrote a poem, he says, containing nine clues. These are clues that lead a person, he says. This language of leading and following and being taken to a location suggests that this is our treasure map, or the closest thing to it that searchers are going to get. We can expect playful, evocative language. This is poetry, after all. But remember the archaic language used in Flywater? Something similar is here. The pictures in the book are in keeping with the mental image we all have of treasure. And there's an old map. Likewise, the poem itself is in keeping with the tradition. And yet, I think this tradition largely exists in novels going back to Treasure Island. People don't hide valuables very often. Treasure hunts are rare. These days, if you Google any combination of words pertaining to treasure, most of the hits will be about forest. So we can fairly say that there is no other chapter in all of literature like this one. With this chapter, indeed with the whole memoir, Forrest Fenn has done something truly spectacular and unique. The next chapter carries forward these same ideas of looking to the past with affection and wondering about the future, even a future that we're not a part of. Many of our chapters have begun with the hand-drawn artwork in miniature beneath the chapter's title. Here we have our one and only photograph. I think Forrest is proud of these bells and jars that he made, and he should be. They're impressive. Forrest is romantic about the past even though undoubtedly people's lives were much harder. And he's pessimistic about the future. All of New Mexico covered in asphalt, food pills, overpopulation. Nevertheless, he intends to make his mark on the future. He hasn't just been working on a hidden treasure, he's been hiding handcrafted cast bronze bells, some of them with clankers made from nails from Spanish galleons, and bronze jars too, with his autobiography, the same one that's in the chest, sealed inside. The differences between the two projects are noteworthy, but there's a great deal of overlap. In the telling of how he fashioned these items, he refers to blacksmithing practices that have been around for hundreds of years, as well as a novel technique that he invented and taught someone else. One generation teaching another. Generational transference. There's a passing reference to Edna St. Vincent Millay's funny little verse called The Second Fig. It feels a little out of place, but I think it fits with the notion of Forrest's behavior being thought of as foolish. He mentions it again and again. We saw something similar in regard to the treasure chest. To prove his point, he compares what he was doing in 2008 and 9 with Dancing with the Stars, from which the chapter gets its name. No one can remember who won those seasons. That's how it often is with flashy things in pop culture. It's a shining palace built upon the sand. But the crazy old man wandering out into the woods with a shovel and a cast bronze jar? He's beat the odds before, and he's betting on making a splash in the year 3000. <laughs>